Welcome to the series where we will take a look at some of the most iconic heroes, gods and creatures from various mythologies. What is the basis of the myth? What inspired it? And what impact did it leave for us, future generations? I'm your one and only host, Reptilicus, and I'll be joining you on this adventure where we will combine fact, fiction and fun. Wait, no, scratch that, no fun allowed. In this episode, we'll journey to Heroic Age Greece, to the area of Lerna, and discover the truth behind one of the most unique and fascinating monsters of myth, the Hydra. Before we dive right in, let's take a look at the origins of the myth, the animal that inspired it all and what effect did it have on humans. Ancient, beautiful, and deadly, obviously depending on the species, snakes have long captivated human imagination. From culture to culture, tribe to tribe, city-state to empire, snakes have left a permanent mark on humanity one way or another. But where did it all begin? Fossil evidence shows that snakes diverged from lizards as early as the mid-Jurassic period, with the currently oldest known stem snake, Eophis, showing up in the fossil record approximately 174 to 163 million years ago, depending on the source. Fun fact, the last common ancestor of both snakes and lizards is thought to have been venomous around 200 million years ago. Even with modern research, it's hard to determine which branch of the lizard tree snakes fell from. Recent genetic study has determined that the closest living relatives of snakes are varanids, aka monitor lizards. Now, this is where the problem begins. Some scholars believe snakes had a terrestrial origin, which is supported by the monitor lizards. But there's another group which advocates a marine origin, with the snakes being closely related to mosasaurids which, surprise surprise, evolved from coastal monitors. Yeah, you can see why this is a little bit of an issue. The important thing is, snakes managed to find success and thrived, as we can see by early Cretaceous fossil records when snakes start becoming more prominent, with many fragmentary finds. Let's just say that snakes have been around for a very long time on the planet, you don't survive for approximately 170 million years if you don't find success in your ecological niche. Snakes spread practically everywhere across the globe, with the exception of the most extreme North, South, Greenland and New Zealand. What a shocker. From deserts, to temperate forest, to rainforest, into the sea, or maybe out of the sea, depending on what theory you fanboy. It comes as no surprise that they've been a constant presence in the lives of early hominids, and later on, our species. Snakes are masters of stealth. Most of the times, you wouldn't even know there was a snake near you, unless it's a species that actively tries to warn potential attackers such as the rattlesnake or king cobra. Even the most experienced hunter could be bitten, without any indication of the viper's presence until it was too late. Snake venom leads to a pretty gruesome death and it's obvious why it would shock any human that witnessed it. This is universal, a lot of people feel uncomfortable or even scared when shown a basic harmless snake, let alone a quote-unquote known killer. As despised as they could be, snakes were also to be respected or even worshipped. In some cases, snakes were seen as symbols of healing as with Asclepius. The shedding of its skin is seen as rebirth through many cultures in the world, as well as being represented in the same context by the Ouroboros. Snakes have inspired many creatures and deities of myth to whom we'll have to dedicate multiple episodes, but let's just take a look at some examples. The Aboriginal peoples of Australia have their Rainbow World Serpent, a creator god. The noble Mayan god Kukulkan. The White Lady, by Nyangzu, is a very popular tale in China. Wajit, the matron cobra goddess of Egypt. Bashmu, an evil serpent of the Mesopotamian area. Interesting, huh? But very few of them have managed to captivate imagination like the protagonist of this episode. And that brings us to the Hydra. The myth behind the Lernaean Hydra, or Lernaea Hydra, is very old and we can only tie it to the second labor of Heracles. And from what we do know is that it predates Homeric writings. 
when it comes to Lerna, the period between 2500 to 1250 BC is the most relevant for its settlement, destruction and later on total abandonment, so we can assume that the Hydra came into the picture between those years. The first written accounts about the Hydra's origin come from Hesiod, aka Isiodos, in his book Theogonia, written somewhere around 700 BC. It explains the origin of many gods and monstrous creatures from Greek mythology. Here we find out that the Hydra is one of the offspring of Typhon and Ehidna. Typhon was an extremely powerful giant monster that had the lower half of a snake and the upper body of a man, and in some accounts he had a hundred dragon heads. Pretty creepy, isn't it? He tried to destroy Zephs, but due to plot armor and being really good at lightning, Zephs kicked his butt and imprisoned him in the underworld or in some other sources in Kilikia or beneath Mount Etna in Sicily. The Hydra's mother, Ehidna, was another powerful creature with the lower half of a snake and the upper body of a woman. You're sensing a pattern here, right? Remember when I said the Hydra was just one of the offspring? Let me introduce you to the family tree. Its siblings were the Himera, Ladon, Orphos and Kerberos. It also had famous step siblings in the Sphinx and the Mian Lion, but we'll get to all of those in another episode. The Hydra is a unique monster. From the knowledge that has survived in written form, there were no other Hydras aside from the one located in Lerna, and it has no other appearances or mentions besides the labors of Heracles, where not only does it have an entire labor dedicated to itself, but its venom is a potent addition to Heracles' arsenal and his later encounters and eventually his downfall. You have to remember, this is based on material evidence. For all we know, there could have been another Hydra or something closely related it could have bred with to create even more twisted monsters. Lucky for us, huh? The Hydra was confined to Lerna, located in Argolida. Based on archaeological excavations, we found out that Lerna has seen continuous human habitation and warfare since the Heladic to the Mekinian period of the Early Bronze Age, between 2500 to 2200 BC. The most famous building on this site, the so-called House of Tiles, was a giant structure that according to some served as some sort of a proto-palace. It's been burned down and destroyed by an invading Heladic type free culture somewhere around 2100 BC. Due to the respect they had towards the now conquered populace, they built a tumulus over it, something pretty much unheard of. For the next few Eladic phases, Lerna sees very little fighting and mostly focuses on trade with their neighbors. We also see the import of Minoan pottery from Crete. And this lasted until its final collapsed. Before the end, it served as a Mikean graveyard, and around 1250 BC, Lerna was permanently abandoned. Hmm. Coincidence? I think not. A lot of mysterious things were going on at Lerna. Lernaean water was well known for its healing properties. According to rumors, the secret of the Lernaean spring was the gift of Posidonus when he had some uh, <clears throat> private time with Amimoni. The geographer Strabon, in his Geographica, mentions that the Lernaean waters had healing properties. Let's sum up the most relevant part. Lake Lerna, the scene of the story of the Hydra, lies in Ergea, in the Mykines. And on account of the cleansings that take place in it, there arose a proverb, a Lerna of ills. But this wasn't the only divine thing about Lerna. It was one of the entrances to the underworld as Addis entered here. Dionysus also entered the underworld through Lerna in search of his mother. See, even gods could be caring at times. Heroes could enter the underworld in the Alcyonian Lake, but for mortals, yeah, let's just say it was dangerous, as in you're pretty much going to die dangerous. There is no limit to the depth of the Alcyonian Lake, and I know of nobody who by any contrivance has been able to reach the bottom of it since not even Nero, who had ropes made several stadies long and fastened them together, tying lead to them, and omitting nothing that might help his experiment, was able to discover any limit to its depth. This too, I heard. The water of the lake is, to all appearance, calm and quiet, but, although it is such to look at, every swimmer who ventures to cross it is dragged down, sucked into the depths, and swept away. 
At Lerna, Pruterhos wrote about cult gatherings where you would have the mysteries of Lerna and Dimitra and also sacrifices in honor of Dionysus. He was summoned as the son of the bull with a trumpet, while a lamb was thrown into the lake as a sacrificial offering to the keeper of the gate. Do you have any idea who the gatekeeper was? Yeah, of course you do. It's the Hydra. The Hydra was a giant serpentine monstrosity. It becomes a little bit harder to determine what kind of snake the Hydra was based on. Water snakes are generally harmless towards people. Even if some species may act aggressive, it's all show. It doesn't mean anything. But if they really wanted a Hydra to be a snake that spends a lot of time around water, then, as my, then it might as well be based on the harmless dice snake. Or grass snake. But that's a little bit of a weak mental image for such a devastating monster, right? And before you say anything, there are no actual sea snakes in Greek waters, unless there was a species that lived here many thousands of years ago without leaving a trace of evidence. If that was the case, then it would be the clear-cut choice for the Hydra, as sea snakes are insanely venomous. Depending on the species, one bite could kill eight people due to the amount of venom it has. Let's not imagine what that could do on a Hydra scale. Going back to more realistic choices, it could have been the Horned Viper. Very deadly and it's got an iconic look with a little horn on top of its nose. Or the Rock Viper. Their venom is fatal to humans if left untreated. And guess what? Considering they didn't have dedicated anti-venom back then, you know what would have happened. The common European Adder is also a viable candidate. Even though its venom is a bit weaker, it's still capable of killing humans if their wounds are not treated. It's hard to give an accurate assessment, but personally, I would lean towards the Horned Viper for the rule of cool, or more sensibly, the Rock Viper. You have to remember though, this is just speaking of modern ranges. Back in the day, snakes were much more present, urbanization didn't happen on this crazy level that we have it today, so maybe even some other species that are technically not in currently endemic to Greece would have been found here. We can't know this for certain, however, Every writer could have had a different vision of the Hydra. This is the good part of mythology. It forces you to go creative and immerse yourself in the story. Make your own Hydra. The most eye-catching feature of the Hydra were its heads. The number of heads have been heavily debated over the centuries. Some would go for nine heads thanks to writers such as Alceos or even later era writers such as Pseudo Hyginius while others like Simonides say that it had 50 or even 100 heads, in some cases like with Diodoros Sicilliotis. To make things even worse, Pausanias hits us with a rational explanation on the Hydra in his description of Greece. At the source of the Amimoni grows a plain tree beneath which, they say, the Hydra grew. I am ready to believe that this beast was superior in size to other water snakes, and that its poison had something in it so deadly that Heracles treated the points of his arrows with its gall. It had, however, in my opinion, one head and not several. It was Pisandros of Camiros, who, in order that the beast might appear more frightful and his poetry might be more remarkable, represented the Hydra with its many heads. All these classical drama queens just couldn't let it go, but luckily for us, the number is pretty much universally accepted to have been nine, as we can see in the Pseudo Apollodoros Bibliotheca. If you ever wanted to learn something about Greek mythology, his work, even though it's fragmentary and incomplete, is pretty much the best thing to read. I highly recommend it, now go read it. After you finish watching the video. If you thought that nine heads were scary, let me tell you this. The Hydra had extremely strong regenerative properties. A trait owed to its reptilian heritage and maybe from sipping on some of that sweet healing water. If one were to be cut off, two would grow in its place. And that's not it. The Hydra's breath was extremely toxic and it was known to use it as a weapon. Breathing it in directly would cause an agonizing death. And to make it even worse, the Hydra was extremely venomous. Even the slightest contact with it could kill you. According to Ovidius, a Roman poet, the arrowheads of Heracles were blackened with the venom of the Hydra. That's how nasty it was. This all would have been fine and cool if the Hydra just kept on chilling outside of the gates of the underworld, but it frequently roamed around, devouring domesticated animals, killing people and just destroying the land. Someone had to put a stop to it, but who could possibly slay such a terrifying beast? Well, no one except the mightiest hero Greece has ever known, Heracles. 
born with the blood of Zeph's coursing through his veins, Heracles was destined for greatness. If only he could survive his childhood. And don't worry, he is also destined for a future episode in this series where we will cover all 12 of his labors in a cinematic fashion. Continuing. Ira was furious at her husband's usual infidelity and she wanted to kill Heracles. So she sent two serpents to kill the baby, they slid her into his crib and tried to kill him. Later, he was found giggling and doing random Greek baby talk while holding the choked snakes in his hands, as it seems that wouldn't be the only time he got his hands on a snake. For his second labor, he was tasked with killing the Lernaean Hydra. For his second labor, Heracles was instructed to slay the Lernaea Hydra. The beast was nurtured in the marshes of Lerna, from where she would go out onto the flat land to raid flocks and ruin the land. The Hydra was of enormous size, with eight mortal heads and a ninth one in the middle that was immortal. With Yolaos driving, Heracles rode a chariot to Lerna. And there, stopping the horses, he found the Hydra on a ridge beside the springs of Amimone, where she nested. By throwing flaming spears at her, he forced her to emerge, and as she did, he was able to catch hold. But she hung on to him by wrapping herself around one of his feet, and he was unable to help matters by striking her with his club, for as soon as one head was pounded off, two others would grow in its place. Then a giant crab, Carquinos, came along to help the Hydra and bit Heracles on the foot. For this, he killed the crab and called on his own behalf to Yolaos for help. Yolaos made some torches by setting fire to a portion of the adjoining woods and by using these to burn the buddings of the heads, he kept them from growing. When he had overcome this problem, Heracles lopped off the immortal head which he buried and covered with a heavy boulder at the side of the road that runs through Lerna to Leos. He cut up the Hydra's body and dipped his arrows in its venom. There are some differing depictions of what Heracles used to kill the Hydra. A sickle, his trusty club or a bronze short sword. Sometimes we even see conflicting sources in the number of the heads the Hydra regenerated, going up to three and even more heads per wound. In the end, it doesn't even matter, for Heracles succeeded in his second task on his own terms. When it comes to its body, Heracles had it cut up and dipped his arrows in its gall. Now thanks to the Hydra Venom, he was unbeatable in archery. The slightest scratch would mean the target would die an agonizing death. This assisted him on his labors and eventually kinda led to his own death. I guess the Hydra got the last laugh out of this. Yeah, it did. But what happened to the Hydra afterwards? Surely the story doesn't end here. According to Pseudo Hyginius in his Astronomica. Ira took pity on the crab and turned it into a constellation. The Hydra was also celestially uplifted and turned into a constellation close to the crab. You know what they say? Allies in life? Allies in death. So, has the Hydra been forgotten after so many thousands of years? Surprisingly, its legacy lives on in many ways. The first one refers to the simple Cnidarian animals that carry its name, the Hydras. I hope you can see the family resemblance. Not only do they have multiple, let's call them heads, but they come with regeneration, a sexual clone reproduction, some also have neurotoxins and they're virtually immortal. These Hydras cannot die of old age, how awesome is that? Moving on from the natural world, we can see that the Hydra survived through humanity's second favorite pastime, art. It inspired many great works of art, ranging from paintings such as Gustave Moreau, various mosaics, ceramics, and figures. It doesn't stop there. The Hydra infiltrated various aspects of our daily lives, such as music, literature, movies, and video games. And when you look upon the sky and see the constellation, you realize the Hydra is here to stay. Here's a list of sources I used for the making of this video. Honestly, there's a lot more, but these are just some of the more relevant ones. They're good to read, good about the Hydra, Heracles, and some general Greek knowledge. Never hurt anybody, right? Okay, that's not true, but still, take a read. Really good books. Alright, well, you made it to the end of the video. Congratulations, I guess. Good for you. I hope you learned something about the Lernaean Hydra and even snakes in general. I don't know about you, but I had so much fun doing this video. It reignited my passion into mythology again. And I want to give, first of all, a special thanks to my friends Vera and Robain Fantasy for whipping me to do this video. No, 
they didn't literally whip me, some other people whipped me, but that's not unrelated to this. I want to thank them for giving me the motivation to go back to doing something I love, which is creating content, and especially creating content like this. I love mythology, I'm here to stay, and I'm planning to do content like this at least once per week on the mythology basis, and this is ignoring everything else. Now, it's gonna cover not just Greece, but it's also going to go through other cultures. So if you would like to see something very specific covered, please type in the comments which creature, demigod or god you would like to see from literally any mythology in existence. I'll, I'll do my best to cover it and go for historical sources. Also, if you want to support your uh, good old pal Reptilicus, which I am not against, please like Give me a kiss on the cheek, share with your friends, do something, man, just... I just want to show more people the joys of mythology and how awesome, amazing Looney Tunes level of crazy and generally screwed up mythology was. And until next time, I really do hope Zeus never takes a romantic interest in you.